This is the Lex Free Podcast, where we abridge the Lex Podcast with love by replacing everything Lex says with a pleasant guitar strum. Enjoy. Yeah, so I guess you're asking a historical question, which is always a good place to start thinking about life. Um, so there's a lot of ideas about how life started on Earth. Um, probably the most popular is what's called the RNA world scenario. Um, so this idea is probably the one that you'll see most reported in the news um, and is based on the idea that there are um, molecules in our bodies um, that uh, relay genetic information. We know those as DNA, obviously, but there's also a sort of an intermediary called RNA, ribonucleic acid, um, that also plays the role of proteins. And um, people came up with this idea in the 80s that maybe that was the first genetic material because it could play both roles of being genetic and performing catalysis. And then somehow that idea got reduced to this idea that there was a molecule that emerged on early Earth and underwent Darwinian evolution, and that was the start of life. Um, so there's a lot of assumptions um, packed in there that we could unpack, um, but that's sort of the leading hypothesis. There's also other ideas about life starting as metabolism, and so that's more connected to the geochemistry of early Earth, um, and it would be kind of more focused on this idea that you get some kind of catalytic cycle of molecules that can reproduce themselves and form some kind of metabolism, and then life starts basically a self-organization, and then you have to explain how evolution comes later. Yeah. There. Yeah, I think that's a good way of putting it. It's um it's kind of funny because I think most of the people that think about these things are really disciplinary bias. So the people that tend to think about genetics come from a biology background and they're really evolution focused. And so they're worried about where does the information come from and how does it change over time? But they're talking about information in a really narrow way where they're talking about a genetic sequence. And then most of the people that think about um metabolism, origins of life scenarios tend to be people like physicists or geochemists that are worried about what are the energy sources and what, you know, like what kinds of organization can you get out of those energy sources. Probably the most popular view for where the original life happened on Earth is hydrothermal vents because they had sufficient energy. Um, and so we don't really know a lot about um, early Earth. Um, we have, you know, some ideas about when oceans first formed and things like that. But the time of the origin of life is kind of um, not well understood or pinned down. And the conditions on Earth at that time are not well known. Um, but a lot of people do think that there was probably hydrothermal vents, which are really hot, um, chemically active regions, say, on the seafloor in modern times, um, which also would have been present on early Earth, um, and they would have provided energy and organics um, and basically all of the right conditions for um, the origins of life, which is one of the reasons that we look for these hydrothermal systems when we're talking about life elsewhere, too. Yeah, that's the basic idea. So the idea is you have in an RNA molecule, you have a sequence of characters, say. So you can treat it like a string in a computer um, and it can be copied. So information can be propagated, um, which is important for evolution um, because evolution happens by having inheritance of information. So for example, you know, like my eyes are brown because my mother's eyes were brown. Um, so you need that copying of information. But then um, you also have the ability to perform catalysis, which means that that RNA molecule is not inert in that environment, but it actually interacts with something and could potentially mediate, say, a metabolism that could then fuel the actual reproduction of that molecule. So in some ways, people think that RNA gives you, um, you know, the most bang for your buck in a single molecule. And therefore, um, you know, it gives you all the features that you might think are life. Um, and so that this is sort of where this RNA world conjecture came from is because of those two properties. Isn't it amazing that RNA came to be in general? Isn't it? Yes, that is amazing. Okay, so, so we're not talking down about RNA. We're, no, 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 still, I love RNA. It's okay. one of my favorite molecules. It's just I think not, it's beautiful. It's just not but, step one. Uh, yeah, I think I think the issue, it's not even the RNA world is a problem. And actually, if you really um, dig into it, um, the RNA world is not one hypothesis. It is a set of hypotheses. Hypotheses, sorry. And they range from a 
molecule of RNA spontaneously emerged on the early Earth and started evolving, which is kind of like the hardest RNA world scenario, which is the one I cited. And I get a little um, uh, animated about because it seems so blatantly wrong to me, but, but that's a separate story. And then the other one is actually something I agree with, which is that you can say there was an RNA world because RNA was the first genetic material for life on Earth. So an RNA world could just be the earliest organisms that had genetics in a modern sense didn't have DNA evolved yet. They had RNA, right? And so that's sort of a softer RNA world scenario in the sense that it doesn't mean it was the first thing that happened, Mm -hmm. but it was a thing that definitely was part of the lineage of events that led to us. I think that's a really difficult question. Um, and is it I, an important question? Sorry, it's a super talk. important question. No, that no, it's a really important question. Um, and so there, there's some. So there's, there's a lot of questions in that question. Um, so one of the first ones that I think needs to be addressed is: Is the origin of life a continuous process on our planet? Yeah. So we think about the origin of life as something that happened on Earth, um, say almost four billion years ago, because we have evidence of life emerging very early on our planet. Um, and then an origin of life event, quote unquote, a singular event, whatever that was, happened. And then all life on Earth that we know is a descendant of that particular event in our universe, right? And so, um, but uh, we don't have um, any idea one way or the other if the origin of life is happening repeatedly. And maybe it's just not taking off because life is already established. That's an argument that people will make. Or um, maybe there are alternative forms of life on Earth that we don't even recognize. Mm. Um, So this is the idea of a shadow biosphere, that there actually might just be completely other life on Earth, but it's so alien that we don't even know what it is. Sure. So I think the reason that most original life scientists are interested in the original life on Earth and say not the original life... Um, you know, on Mars and then panspermia, you know, the exchange of life between planets being the explanation is once you start removing the original life from Earth, you know even less about it than you do if you study it on Earth. Although I think there are ways of reformulating the problem. This is why I said earlier, like, oh, you mean the historical original life problem? You don't mean the problem of how does life arise in the universe and what the universal principles are because there's this historic problem. How did it happen on early Earth? And there's a more tractable general problem of how does it happen? Um, And how does it happen is something we can actually ask in the lab. How does it, how did it, how did it happen on early earth is um, a much more detailed and nuanced question and requires detailed knowledge of what was happening on early earth that we don't have. Um, And I'm personally more interested in general mechanisms. So to me, it doesn't matter if it happened on earth or it happened on Mars. Um, it just matters that it happened. We have evidence it happened. Um, the question is, did it happen more than once in our universe? And so the reason I don't find panspermia as a particularly, I think it's a fascinating um, hypothesis. I definitely think it's possible. Um, and um, and I in particular think it's possible once you get to the stage of a life where you have technology, because then you, you obviously can spread out into the cosmos. Um, But it's also possible for microbes because we know that um, certain microorganisms can survive the journey in space and we, you know, they can live in a rock and go between Mars and Earth. Like people have done experiments to try to prove that could work. Um, So in that scenario, it's super cool because then you get planetary exchange. But say we go find, we go look for life on Mars and it ends up being exactly the same life we have on Earth, biochemically speaking, then we haven't really discovered something new about the universe. Mm-hmm. What kind of aliens are possible? Were there other original life events? Yeah. If we find, if all the life we ever find is the same original life event in the universe, it doesn't help me solve my problem. Yeah, I think this is actually super important to just think about like, does life getting seated on a planet have to be geochemically compatible with that planet. So you're suggesting like we could just shoot guns in space and like life could go to Mars and then it would just live there and be happy there. Um, But that's actually an open question. So one of the things I was going to say in response to your question about whether the origin of life happened once or multiple times is for me personally right now in my thinking, although this changes on a weekly basis, but um, is that I think of life more as a planetary phenomena. So I think the origin of life, because, um, because life is so 
um, intimately tied to planetary cycles and planetary processes, and this goes all the way back through the history of our planet, that the origin of life itself grew out of geochemistry and became coupled and controlled geochemistry. And, and when we start to talk about life existing on the planet is when we have evidence of life actually influencing properties of the planet. Um, and so, so if life is a planetary property, um, then going to Mars is not a trivial thing because you basically have to make ours Mars more Earth-like. Um, and so in some sense, um, like when I think about sort of long-term vision of humans in space, for example, really what you're talking about when, when you're saying, let's send our civilization to Mars, is you're not saying, let's send our civilization to Mars. You're saying, let's reproduce our planet on Mars. Like the information from our planet actually has to go to Mars and make Mars more Earth-like, which means that you're now having a reproduction process, like a cell reproduces itself to propagate information in the future planets have to figure out how to reproduce their con conditions, including geochemical conditions, on other planets in order to actually reproduce life in the universe, which is kind of a little bit radical. But I think um, for long-term sustainability of life on a planet, that's absolutely essential. I actually don't think that's the right question to ask. It took me a long time to get there, right? You so cross I it out. Yeah. <laughs> off your list it's wrong uh, next no. question um no 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 i mean i think it has an answer but i think the par part of the problem is um you know most of the places in science where we get really stuck is because we don't know what questions to ask right. um and so you can't answer a question if you're asking the wrong question um and i think uh the way I think about it is obviously I'm interested in what life is. So I'm being a little cheeky when I say that's the wrong question to ask. That's exactly like the, the question that's like the core of my existence. But um, but I think the way of framing that is what is it about our universe that allows features that we associate life to be there? Um, and so really what I guess when I'm asking that question, what I'm after is an explanatory framework for what life is, right? And so most people, they try to go in and define life and they say, well, life is, uh, say, a self-reproducing chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. That's a very popular definition for life. Um, or life is something that metabolizes and eats. Um, that is not how I think about life. What I think about life is there are principles and laws that govern our universe um, that we don't understand yet. Um, that have something to do with um, how information interacts with the physical world. I don't know exactly what I mean even when I say that um, because we don't know these rules. Um, but it's a little bit like um, – I like to use analogies. It'll give me time to be like a little long-winded for a second even in as I um, – but, um, but so, sort of like if you look at the history of physics, for example, this is like – so we are in the period of the development of – thought on our planet where we don't understand what we are yet, right? Um, there was a period of thought in the history of our planet where we didn't understand what gravity was. Um, and we didn't understand, for example, that planets in the heavens, you know, were actually planets or that they operated by the same laws that we did. Um, and so there has been this sort of progression of getting a deeper understanding of explaining basic phenomena like, I'm not going to drop the cup, I'll drop the water bottle. There you go. Okay, that fell, right? But why did that fall? Um, <laughs> this is why I'm a theorist, not an experimentalist. <laughs> that could have gone wrong in so many ways. I know it could have, especially if I did the cup and it smashed. Anyway, <laughs> um, so um, so if you think you take this view that there's sort of some missing principles, I associate them uh, to information, and what it, what the sort of feeling there is, there's some missing explanatory framework for how our universe works. And if we understood that physics, it would explain what we are. Um, it might also explain a lot of other features we don't associate to life. Um, and so it's a little like um, people accept the fact that gravity is a universal phenomena. Um, but when we want to study gravity, we study things like large scale, um, you know, galactic structures or black holes or planets. Um, if we want to understand information and how it operates in the physical world, we study intelligent systems or living systems because they are the manifestation of that physics. Um, and the fact that we can't see that clearly yet, or we don't have that explanatory framework, I think is just because we haven't been thinking about the problem deeply enough. But I feel like if you're explaining something, you're deriving it from some more fundamental property. And of course, um, I have to say I'm wearing my my physicist hat, so I have a, a huge bias of liking simple, elegant explanations of the universe that, um, you know, really are compelling. But I think um, one of the things that I've sort of 
maybe in some ways rejected my training as a physicist is that most of the elegant explanations that we have so far don't include us in the universe. And I can't help but think there's something really special about what we are and there have to be some deep principles at play there. Um, and so, so that's sort of my perspective on it. Now, when you ask me what life is, I have some ideas of what I think it is, but I think that we haven't gotten there yet because we haven't been able to see that structure. And it's, and, and just to go back to the gravity example, it's a little like, you know, in ancient times, they didn't know, I was talking about stars and heavens and things. They didn't know those were, um, you know, governed by the same principles as that darned experiment. Here's mm -hmm. where I was going with it. Once you realize, like Newton did, that, you know, heavenly motions and earthly motions are governed by the same principles and you unify terrestrial and celestial motion, you get these more p powerful ideas. Um, and I, I, I think where life is, is somehow unifying these abstract ideas of computation and information with the physical world, with matter, and realizing that there's some explanatory framework that's not physics and it's not computation, but it's something that's deeper. No, I don't think so. Oh, damn it. Okay. I know. It doesn't help, does it? I know. I, I hate, actually, I hate this about what I do because it's so hard to communicate, right? With right. words, like when you have words that are um, ideas that have historically described one thing and you're trying to describe something people haven't seen yet. Right. And the words just don't fit. So what uh, what's wrong? Is it too ambiguous, the word information? We could switch I, to binary if you want. <laughs> yeah, no, I don't think it's binary either. Okay. Um, I think information is just loaded. I use it. So the other way I might talk about it is the physics of causation. But I think that's worse because causation is even more loaded word than um, information. So causation so is fundamental, you think? I do, yeah. And um, in some sense, I think the physics, so this is the really radical part. Some sense, like when I really think about it sort of most deeply, uh, what I think life is, is actually the physics of existence. What gets to exist and why? Um, and, you know, for simple elementary particles, that's not very complicated because the interactions are simple. But for things like, um, you know, you and me and human civilizations, um, you know, what comes next in the universe is really dependent on what came before. And there's a huge space of possibilities of things that can exist. And when I say information and causation, what I mean is, why is it that uh, cups evolved in the universe and not some other object that could deliver water and not spill it? Um, <laughs> I don't know what you would call it. Uh, maybe it wouldn't be a cup, but um, but it's a huge, it, it, it's, um, you know, uh, you know, people talk about the space of things that could exist as being actually infinitely large, right? I don't know if I believe in infinity, um, but I do think that there is something very interesting about the problem of what exists in its relationship to life. So there's a couple of problems in physics that I think this is related to. One is why does mathematics work at describing reality so well? Um, and then there is this problem of we don't understand why the laws of physics are the way they are or why certain things get to exist or what put in place the initial condition of our universe, right? There's all of these sort of really deep and big problems. And they they all um, indirectly are related, I think, to the same kind of thing that, um, you know, our physics is really good if you specify the initial condition at, at specifying a certain sequence of events, but it doesn't deal with the fact that other things could have happened, which is kind of an informational property, like a counterfactual property. Um, and it's not good at explaining, uh, you know, this conversation right now. It's just, it. there are certain things that are outside the, the explanatory reach of current physics. And um, I think they require looking at it from a completely different direction. Um, and so I don't want to have to fine tune the initial condition of the universe to specify precisely all the information in this conversation. I think that's a ridiculous assertion. Um, but that's sort of like how people want to frame it when they talk about, um, you know, the standard model is sufficient if we had computing power to basically explain all of life and our existence. We can't just couple the information from the physics. And I think that's what we've gotten really good at doing, especially with um, sort of the modern age where, you know, software is so abstracted um, from hardware. Um, but the entire process of biological evolution has basically been built, like been building layers of increasing abstraction. And so it's really hard to see that physics in us, but it's much clearer to see it in molecules. Open mind? Is that a tool? <laughs> <laughs>
what's the physics of an open mind? (laughs) (laughs) I think if we solve that, we'll solve everything. I'm saying an open mind because I think the biggest stumbling block um, to understanding sort of the things I've been trying to articulate or, and when I talk also with colleagues that are thinking deeply about these same issues is none of it is inconsistent with what we know. It's just such a radically different perception of the way we understand things now that it's hard for people to get there. And in some ways, you have to almost forget what you've learned in order to learn something new, right? So I feel like most of my career trying to understand the problem of life has been variously forgetting and then relearning things that I learned in physics. And and I think you you have to have a capacity to learn things but then accept that things that you were you you learned might not be true, um, or or might need refinement or reframing. Um, and the best way I can say that is just like with a physics education, there are just certain things you're told in undergrad that are like facts about the world, mm-hmm. and your physics professors never tell you that those facts actually emerge from a human mind, right? So we're taught to think about, say, the laws of physics, for example, mm-hmm. as this like autonomous thing that exists outside of our universe and tells our universe how it works. Yeah. Um, But the laws of physics were invented by human minds to describe things that are regularities in our everyday experience. Right. They don't exist autonomous to the universe. So I like cellular automata. I think they're good toy models. Um, But mostly like where I've thought about them and used them is to actually, um, let's see, poke at sort of the current conceptual framework that we have and see where the flaws are. Um, So I think like the part that you're talking about that people find intriguing is that if you have like a fairly simple rule and you specify some initial condition and you run that rule on that initial condition, you could get really complex patterns emerging. And ooh, doesn't that look lifelike? Um, Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, it's like really surprising, isn't it? Really, it surprising? is really surprising, and they're beautiful. Um, and I, I think they have a lot of nice features associated to them. Um, I think the things that I find, yeah. So, so I, I do think um, as a proof of principle that you can get complex things emerging from simple rules. They're great. Um, as a sort of proof of principle about some of the ways that we might think of computation as being sort of a fundamental principle for dynamical systems and maybe the the evolution of the universe as a whole, they're a great model system. As an explanatory framework for life, I think um, they're a bit problematic for the same reason that the laws of physics are a bit problematic. Um, And the clearest way I can articulate that is like cellular automata are actually cast in sort of a conceptual framework for how the universe should be described that goes all the way back to Newton, in fact, with this idea that we can have a fixed law of motion, which exists sort of, it's given to you. (laughs) Um, You know, the great programmer in the sky gave you this equation or this rule, and then you just run with it. Um, And the rule doesn't have, so a good feature of the rule is it doesn't have specified in the rule information about the patterns it generates. So you wouldn't want, for example, the my cup or my water bottle or, you know, me sitting here to be specified in the laws of physics. That would be ridiculous because it wouldn't be a very simple explanation of all the things happening. It'd have to explain everything. So, and cellular time to have that feature um, and the laws of physics have that feature. Um, but, but, you know, you also need to specify the initial condition. Um, and it also it basically means that everything that happens is sort of a consequence of that initial condition. And I think this kind of framework is just not the right one for biology. Um, and part of the way that it's easiest to see this is um, a lot of people talk about self-reference being important in life. The fact that, um, you know, like the genome has information encoded in it, that information gets read out. Um, It specifies something about the architecture of a cell. Um, The architecture of the cell includes the genome. So the genome has basically self-referential information. Self-reference obviously comes up in um, computation a lot because it's kind of foundational um, to Turing's work and what Gödel did with the incompleteness theorems and things. So there's a lot of um, parallels there, and and people have talked about that at depth. Um, But the other way of kind of thinking about it in terms of like a more physics-y way of talking about it is that what it looks like in biology is that the rules or the laws depend on the state. This is typical in computer mm-hmm. science. This is obvious to you. Mm-hmm. You know, the update rule depends on the state of the machine, right? But in, you know, you don't think about um, 
uh, you know, that being sort of the dynamic in physics, it's, you know, the rules given to you and then it, you know, it's a, it's a very special subclass, say, of computations if, you know, you don't ever change the update. Um, but in biology, it seems to be that the state and the law change together as a function of time. And we don't have that as a paradigm in physics. Um, and so a lot of people talked about this as being kind of a perplexing feature, that maybe there are certain scenarios where the laws of physics or the laws that govern a particular system actually change as a function of the state of that system. Right. Okay. And, and just, even having laws that vary in time, and not even as a function of the state, is very radical when you... The when time you, in general. Like, yeah. you, you want to remove time from the equation as much as possible. Yeah, I, I do. Um, there's some interesting things in this, like when we think sort of deep, more deeply about the actual physics that we're trying to propose governs life, um, with me with collaborators, and then also other people that think about similar things, that time might actually be fundamental, and there really is an ordering to time. Um, and that events in the universe are unique because they have a particular, you know, they, they happen, like an object in the universe requires a certain history of events in order to exist, which therefore suggests that time really does have an ordering. I'm not talking about the flow of time and our perception of time, just the ordering of events. Yes. And then space is emergent? Yes. So everything is emergent except time. Kind of. Yeah, or causation. And laws I would say change causation. all the time. Why does well, it look like no, laws, laws are the same? Laws, well, because, uh, well, one way, um, and I actually, this idea comes from Lee Cronin because I work with him very closely on these things, is that the laws of physics look the way they do because they're low memory laws. So they don't require a lot of information to specify them. They're very easy for the universe to implement. But if you get something like me, for example, I require a 4 billion year history to exist in the universe. I come with a lot of historical baggage. Um, and that's part of what I am as a set of causes that exist in the universe. Um, so I have local rules that apply to me that are associated with sort of the information in my history um, that aren't universal to every object in the universe. Um, and there are some things that are very easily easy to implement, low memory rules that apply to everything in the universe. Hmm. So there's no shortcuts to you? Like no. I, so, yeah, I don't believe in, like, things like Boltzmann brains or, uh, you know, fluctuations out of the vacuum that can produce things like your desk ornaments. Um, <laughs> I actually think they require a particular causal chain of events to exist. Life. Yeah, that's... In um, the lab. This goes back to sort of the critique of the RNA world. I think one of the problems, and, and I'll get to answering your question, but I think this is kind of relevant here. Mm -hmm. One of the problems of the RNA world, um, when we test it in the laboratory, is how much information we're putting into the experiment. Um, we specify the flasks, we make pure reagents, we mix them, we take them out, we put them in the next flask, we change the pH, we change the UV light, and then we get a molecule. And it's not even an RNA molecule necessarily. It might just be a base, right? Um, and so people don't usually think about the fact that we're agents in the universe making that experiment, and therefore we put a little bit of life into that experiment um, because it's part of our biological lineage in the same sense that a cup or, or I am a part of the biological lineage. The experiment our ideas is- ideas are injecting life. Yes, to the experiment. and the constraints that we put on the experiments because those conditions wouldn't exist in the universe on planet Earth at that time without us as the boundary condition, right? So- uh Yeah, you can think of the design of the experiment as a program. You put information in. It's it's an algorithmic procedure that you design the experiment. And so um, so the origin of life problem becomes one of minimizing the information we put into physics right. to actually watch the spontaneous origin of life. I think by it? training he's a chemist, but I think most of the people that work in the field, we do have lost their discipline. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I couldn't answer your question earlier. Okay. I don't know what you call them. Yeah. I don't know what I call myself. I don't know what I call any of my friends. <laughs> I think echoes is more appropriate. I don't think asking the question of what was the exact historical sequence of events and engineering every step in the process to make exactly the chemistry of life on Earth as we know it is a meaningful way of asking the question. Right. And it's a little bit like... Um, 
you know, if since you're in computer science, like if you know the answer to a problem, it's all it's easier to find a program to specify the output, right? But if you don't know the answer a priori, you know, finding an algorithm for like say finding a prime or something, it's easy to, um, you know, uh, verify it's a prime number. It's hard to find the next prime, um, and uh, the way the original life is structured right now in the historical problem is you know the answer and you're trying to retrodict it by breaking it down into the set of procedures where you're putting a lot of information in. And what we need to do is ask the question of how is it that the rules of how our universe is structured permit things like life to exist and what is the phenomena of life? And those questions are obviously essentially the same question. And so you're looking essentially for this missing physics, this missing explanation for what we are, and you need to set up proper experiments that are going to allow you to probe the vast complexity of chemistry in an unconstrained way with as little information put in as possible to see when things, when does information actually emerge? How does it emerge? What is it? Um, and um, part of the the sort of conjecture we have is that this physics only becomes relevant, or at least this is, this is my personal conjecture, and um, and it's sort of uh, validated by this kind of theory experiment collaboration um, that we we have working in this area. Um, that this, you know, sort of, I, mean, I made the point about like gravity existing everywhere, right? But when you study um, an atomic nucleus, you don't care about gravity. It's not relevant physics there, right? It's it's weak. It doesn't matter. Um, and so uh, this idea that that there's kind of a physics associated with information. Um, for me, um, it's very evident that that physics doesn't become relevant until you need information to specify the existence of a particular object. And the scale of reality where that happens is in chemistry because of the combinatorial diversity of chemical objects that can exist far out uh, exceeds the amount of resources in our universe. So if you want it, you can't make every possible protein of length um, you know, 200 amino acids, there's not enough resources. So in order to, for this particular protein to exist and this protein to exist in high abundance means that you have to have a system that has knowledge of the existence of that protein and can build it. It's most evident. It's, it's a little bit it. like nobody argues that gravity doesn't exist in an atomic nucleus. It's just not relevant physics there. So the right? physics of information is everywhere. It exists at every combinatorial scale, but it becomes more and more relevant the more set of possibilities that could exist because you're 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 you have to specify more and more about why this thing exists and not the infinite it's not an infinite set, but you know, the set of undefined set of other things that could exist. This is an excellent question. I want to sorry, I I'm going to make a quick point which is just this slight tangent, but, you know, like when people ask about the origin of mass, you know, and like looking for the Higgs mechanism and things, they never are like, we need to find the historical origins of life in the early, you know, although those things are related, right? So, um, so this problem of origins of life in the lab, I think is really important, but the, the Higgs is a good example because you had theory to guide it. So somehow you need to have an explanatory framework, um, that can say that we should be looking for these features, um, and explain why they might be there and then be able to do the experiment and demonstrate that it matches with the theory. But it has to be something that is outside sort of the paradigm of what we might expect based on what we know, right? So this is a really sort of tall order. Um, and I think, um, I mean, I, I guess the way people would think about it is like, you know, if you had a bacteria that climbed out of your test tube or something and it was like, you know, moving around on the surface, that would be ultimate validation. You saw the original life in, in an experiment. But I don't think that's quite what we're looking for. I think what what we're looking for is evidence of when information that originated within the bounds of your experiment and you can demonstrably prove emerged spontaneously in your experiment wasn't put in by you actually started to govern the, the future dynamics of that system and specify it. And you could somehow relate those two features directly. So you know that the program specifying what's happening in that system is actually internal to that system. Like say you have a chemical thing in a box. Yeah. What? So I actually know, I mean, sugar is information, right? So part of the argument here is that every physical object is Right. Well, it's information, but it's a set of causal histories and also a set of possible futures. So there is an experiment um, 
that I've talked a lot about uh, with Lee Cronin, but also with Michael Lockman and Chris Kempis, who are at Santa Fe, about this idea that sometimes we talk about as like seating assembly, um, which mm-hmm. is you take a high high complexity, like a, a an object that exists in the universe because of a long causal history, and you seed it into a system of lower causal history. And then suddenly you see all of this complexity being generated. So I think another validation of the physics would be say you engineer an organism by by purposefully introducing something where you understand the relationship between the causal history of the organism and the, say, very complex chemical set of ingredients you're adding to it. And then you can predict the future evolution of that system to some um, statistical uh, set of constraints and, and possibilities for what it will look like hmm. in the future. You know, I'm a physical structure, obviously. Like, I, I'm composed of atoms, um, the configuration of them and the fact that they happen to be me um, is because I'm not actually my atoms. I am a informational pattern that keeps repatterning those atoms into Sarah. Um, and I have also associated to me uh, like a space of possible things that could exist <laughs> that I can help mediate come into existence because of the information in my history. Um, And so when you understand sort of that time is a real thing embedded in a physical object, um, then it becomes possible to talk about how histories, when they interact, and a history is not a unique thing, it's a set of possibilities. Mm -hmm. When they interact, how do they specify what's coming next? And then where does the novelty come from in that structure? Because some of it is kind of things that haven't existed in the past can exist in the future. Mm -hmm. Problems are absolutely related. I think um, most, and I'm interested in both because I'm just interested in what we are. And to me, the most interesting feature of what we are is our minds and the way they interact with other minds. Like minds are the most beautiful thing that exists in the universe. So how do they come to be? Uh, you, uh, yeah, you, you could think of me as a bundle of information that just yeah. became temporarily aggregated in yeah, a particular locally, individual. Yeah, yeah that's okay. fine. I agree with that view. Um, <laughs> okay. I'll take that as a compliment. Actually. Yeah, I think I'm conscious right now, but I might not be, but that's okay. Um, or you wouldn't know. Um, so yeah, so this is the problem. So yeah, usually people, when they're talking about consciousness, are worried about the subjective experience. And so I think that's why you're saying, I don't know if you're conscious, because I don't know if you're experiencing right. this conversation right now. Um, and nor do you know if I'm experiencing the conversation right now. Um, and so this is why this is called the hard problem of consciousness, because it seems impenetrable from the outside to know if something's having a conscious experience. Um, and I really like, um, uh, the idea of also like the hard problem of matter, which is related to the hard problem of consciousness, which is you don't know the intrinsic properties of an electron not interacting, say, for example, with anything else in the universe. All the properties of anything that exists in the universe are defined by its interaction because you have to interact with it in order to be able to observe it. So we can only actually know the things that are observable from the outside. And so this is one of the reasons that consciousness is hard for science because you're asking questions about something that's subjective and supposed to be intrinsic to what that thing is as it exists and how it feels about existing. Um And so I have thought a lot about this problem and its relationship to the problem of life. And the only thing I can come up with to try to make that problem scientifically tractable um, and also relate it to how I think about the physics of life is to ask the question, are there things that can only happen in the universe because there are physical systems that have subjective experience? So does subjective experience have different causes that things that it can cause to occur um, that would happen in the absence of that? I don't know the answer to that question, but I think that's a meaningful ask, way of asking the question of consciousness. I can't ask if you're having experience right now, but I can ask if you having experience right now changes something about you and the way you interact with the world. It's a real physical thing, right? It has physical consequences. I'm a physicist. I'm biased. So I don't, you know, I can't get rid of that bias. It's really deeply ingrained. Um, I've tried. (laughs) Yeah, it does. And I I, I can't remember what state of mind I was when I was actually thinking about that. But um, 
But I think part of it is so- But you never thought you were gonna have to analyze your own tweets. No, I didn't. It's an interesting uh, historical juxtaposition of thinking, so So the yeah. tweet is a historical- uh, Here, You're doing an assembly experiment right now because yeah, exactly. you're bringing a thought from the past into the present and trying exactly. to actually- in the lab. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, this is experimental science right here. Okay, great. On the podcast live. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so so go, let's see how the consciousness um, evolves on this one. Yeah, so um, in neuroscience, it's kind of accepted that we can't get at the subjective aspect of consciousness. So people are very interested in what would be a correlate of consciousness. So, um, so uh, What's a correlate? A correlate is a feature that relates to conscious activity. So for example, um, you know, a verbal report is a correlate of consciousness because, um, you know, I can tell you when I'm conscious. <laughs> and then when I'm sleeping, for example, I can't tell you I'm conscious. So we have this assumption that you're not conscious when you're sleeping and you're conscious when you're awake. Yeah. Um, and so, so that's sort of like a, a very obvious example, but uh, neuroscientists, which I, you know, I'm, I'm no neuroscientist and I'm not an expert in this field. So, um, but you know, they have very sophisticated ways of measuring, you know, activity in our brain and trying to relate that to verbal report and other proxies for whether someone is experiencing something. Um, and that's what is meant by neural correlates. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so when people are trying to think about um, studying consciousness or developing theories for consciousness, they often are trying to build an experimental bridge to these neural correlates, recognizing the fact that a neural correlate may or may not correspond to consciousness because that problem's hard and there's all these associated issues to it. No, I just made that up. Okay. That was an original to that tweet. You can cite the tweet. <laughs> Maybe I'll write it in a paper someday. <laughs> uh. Yeah, so I think in astrobiology, it's not, um, there's no concept of chemical correlates of life. We don't think about it that way. We think if we find molecules that are involved in biology, we found life. So I think I, I, I think one of my motivations there was just to separate the fact that life has abstract properties associated to it. They become imprinted in, in material substrates. Um, and those substrates are correlates for that thing, but they are not necessarily the thing we're actually looking for. The thing that we're looking for is the physics that's organizing that system to begin with, not the particular molecules. Um, in the same sense that, that, you know, your consciousness is, is not your brain. <laughs> it's, 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 it, it's instantiated in your brain that, you know, it has to have a physical substrate, but it's not the, the matter is not the thing that you're looking at. It's some other, at least not in the way that we have come to look at matter, you know, with traditional physics and things, there's, there's something else there. And it, it might be this feature of history I was talking about our time being actually, you know, physically represented there. Do you think consciousness can be engineered? Yes. In the same way that life can be. Wow, engineered. that was a fast answer. I didn't even think about that. That's interesting. You don't have a free will. That was no. I do have free will, but it's interesting because some. I mean, I you know you know. Now you're backtracking. No, no. I <laughs> and do that was predestined. <laughs> yeah. No. No. Sorry. Um, no, I do believe in free will, but I also think that there's kind of kind of an interesting. Um, you know, like what you're you, speaking about consciousness, what are you consciously aware of versus like, what is your subconscious brain actually processing and doing? And, and sometimes there's conflict between your consciousness and your subconsciousness, or your consciousness is a little slower than your subconscious. And intuition is a really important feature of that. And so a lot of the ways I do my science is guided by intuition. Um, so when I give fast answers like that, I think it's usually because I haven't really thought about them. And therefore that's probably telling me something. <laughs> life. Yeah. And you threw free will in there. You're just throwing all the, the stuff in the bag. Are, um, are they not related? To no, no, they are. They are related. No, no. Sorry. I was being unfair. You didn't even capitalize the tweet, by the way. It was all lowercase. I must have been angry. <laughs> oh, that was, was saying, can you analyze the emotion behind that? <laughs> no, I actually did. Frustration? I, or is, yeah, oh. maybe. So I already argued that I don't think that can happen without that whole causal history. And so I guess in some sense, um, the determinism for me arises because of the causal history. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not really sure actually about whether the universe is random or deterministic. I just had this sort of 
intuition for a long time. I'm not sure if I agree with it anymore, but it's still kind of lingering and I don't know what to do with this question. But it seems to me, you know, so there's, you asked the question, what is life? But you could also, why life? Why does life exist? What what does the universe need life for? Not that the universe has needs, but, you know, we have to anthropocentrize things sometimes to talk mm-hmm. about them. Um, and I had this feeling that if it was possible for a cup or a desk ornament or a phone on Mars to spontaneously fluctuate into existence. The universe didn't need life to create those objects. It wasn't necessary for their existence. It was just a random fluke event. And so somehow to me, it seems that it can't be that those things form by random processes. They actually have to have a set of causes that accrue and form those things and they have to have that history. And so it seems to me that that life was somehow deeply related to the question of whether the underlying rules of our universe had randomness in them or they were fully deterministic. And in some ways you can think about life as being the most deterministic part of physics uh, because it's where the causes are um, precise in some sense. Um, Because I'm a Do you determ- think you have a free will and yet you value causality? Um, because I depart from the conception of physics that you can write down an initial condition and a fixed law of motion and that will describe everything. Awesome. There's no incompatibility if you are willing to reject that assertion. No, free, um, in, in my mind, what free will is, is the fact that I... I, as a physical system, have causal control over certain things. I don't have causal control over everything, but I have a a certain set of things. And I'm also, um, you know, as I described, sort of a nexus of a particular set of histories that exist in the universe and a particular set of futures that might exist. Um, And those futures that might exist are in part specified by my physical configuration as me. Um, And therefore, you know, it may not be free will in the traditional sense. I don't even know what people mean when they're talking about free will, honestly. It's like the whole discussion is really muddled. But in the sense that I am a causal agent, if you want to call it that, that exists in the universe, and there are certain things that happen because I exist as me, then yes, I have free will. No, but do you, Sarah, have a choice about what's going to happen next? Oh, I see. Um, like if the universe, could I have, if I run this Yes, I think now, so. You have a choice. Where does the choice come from? Is it? I think that's related to the physics of consciousness. So one of the things I didn't say about that, I, I don't know, maybe this is me just being hopeful um, because I, maybe I just want to have free will, but I don't think that we can rule out the possibility because I don't think that we understand enough about any of these problems. But I think one of the things that's interesting for me about the sort of inversion of the question of consciousness that I proposed is one of the features that that we do is we have imagination, right? And people don't think about imagination as a physical thing, but it is a physical thing. Mm -hmm. It exists in the universe, right? Um, And so I'm like really intrigued by the fact that say humans for, you know, another physical system could do this too. It's not special to humans, but, uh, you know, for centuries imagined flying machines and rockets, and then we finally built them, right? So they they were represented in our minds and on the pages of things that we drew, for hundreds of years before we could build those physical objects in the universe. Um, But certainly the existence of rockets is in part um, causally, uh, you know, caused by the fact that we could imagine them. Um, And so so there seems to be this property that some things don't exist. They've never physically existed in the universe, but we can imagine the possibility of them existing and then cause them to exist, maybe individually or collectively. Um, And I think that property is related to what I would say about having choice or free will, because that set of possibilities, that thing, those set of things that you can imagine is not constrained to your local physical environment and history. And this is what's a little bit different about intelligence as we see it in humans and AI that we want to build than biological intelligence, because biological intelligence is predicated completely on the history of things it's seen in the past. But something happened with the neural architectures that evolved in multicellular organisms that they don't just have access to the past history of their particular, you know, set of events, but they can imagine things that haven't happened, aren't on their timeline, and as long as they're consistent with the laws of physics, make them happen. Mm. 
kind of basically, if you want to think about it, like life is sort of changing the probability distributions over what can exist. That's the physics of what life is. And then consciousness is this sort of layered property or imagination on top of it that kind of scrambles that a little bit more and like has, you know, access to, I don't, I don't know. It's, it's kind of, it, we don't know how to describe it, right? Like but, that's why it's interesting, but. But it's probabilistic. So you do think like God plays dice. So let me. Um, no, I think the description's probabilistic. I don't necessarily think the um, underlying physics is probabilistic. I think, I, think, I think the way that we can describe this physics is going to be probabilistic and statistical, but the under, like when we take measurements in the lab, but the underlying physics itself might still be deterministic. I don't, I, I don't know, maybe I'm, I, it's, it's hard to know what concepts to hold on to. So I find myself right. constantly rejecting concepts, right. but then I have to grab another one and try to hold on to something from intellectual history, well, but. Well, it's possible. I used to not, but I actually, uh, I have become increasingly convinced that it probably will. Um, and part of the reason is, um, I think I've, I've talked a little bit already about these holes in physics, like these, the, the theories we have in physics, you know, they have problems, they have lots of problems, um, and they're very deep problems, um, and we don't know how to patch them. Um, and some of those problems become very evident when you try to patch um, quantum mechanics and general relativity together. Um, so there is this kind of interesting feature that some of the ways of patching that might actually um, closely resemble uh, the physics of life. And so the place where that actually comes up most, and actually we just had a workshop um, in the Beyond Center where I work at Arizona State University, um, and Lee Smolin made this point that he thinks that the theory of quantum gravity, when we solve it, is going to be the same theory that gives rise to life. Um, and I think that I agree with him on some levels because there's something very interesting where if you look at these sort of causal set theories of gravity where they're looking for space um, as being emergent, and so space-time is an emergent concept from a causal set, which is, is also sort of related, I think, to what Wolfram's doing with his physics project. Um, it's the same kind of underlying math that we have in, in this theory that we've been developing related to life called assembly theory, um, which is, you know, basically trying to look at complex objects like molecules and um, bacteria and living things as um, sort of... Uh, as basically being assembled from a, a set of component parts um, and that they actually encode all the possible histories that they could have in that physical object. So the mathematically, all these ideas, I think, are related. I think a lot of people are thinking about this from different perspectives. And then constructor theory um, that David Deutsch and Kara Marletto have been developing is a totally different angle on it, but I think getting at some similar ideas. So it's a really interesting time right now, I think, for the frontiers of physics and how it's relating um, to maybe deeper principles about what life is. So short answer, yes. Long-winded answer, rewind. Yeah. So we have a paper actually coming out on Monday, which is collaboration. Um, it's, it's actually really Lee Cronin's lab, but my group worked with him on it and we're working on the theory, which is this idea that we should look for life um, as high assembly objects. What we mean by that is, um, which is actually observationally measurable. And this is one of the reasons that I started working with Lee on these ideas is because being a theorist, it's easy to work in a vacuum. It's very hard to connect abstract ideas about the nature of life to anything that's experimentally tractable. Mm -hmm. um, but what his lab has been able to do is develop this method where they look at a molecule and they break it apart into all, all its component parts. And so you say you have some elementary building blocks and you can build up all the ways of putting those together to make the original object. Mm -hmm. And then you look for the shortest path in that space. Um, and you say that's sort of the assembly number associated to that object. Um, and if that number is higher, it assumes that a longer causal, causal history is necessary to produce that object or more information is necessary to specify the creation of that object in the universe. Now, that kind of uh, idea at a superficial level has existed for a long time. That kind of idea as a physical observable of molecules is completely novel. And what his lab has been able to show is that if you look at a bunch of samples of non-biological things and biological things, there's this kind of threshold um, of assembly where all, as far as the experimental evidence is and also your intuitive intuition would suggest that bi non-biological systems don't produce things with high assembly number. Um, so this goes back to the idea like a protein's not going to spontaneously fluctuate into existence on the surface of Mars. It requires an evolutionary process and a biological architecture to produce a protein. You generalize that argument 
you know, a complex molecule or, or a cup or a desk ornament um, in this sort of abstract idea of assembly spaces as being um, the causal history of objects. And you can talk about the shortest path from elementary objects to an object given an elementary set of operations. And you can experimentally measure that with a mass spec. And that's basically sort of the it's idea. Right, right. To find a little right. Lego castles. <laughs> so, the, so, yeah. So then like asking about going to look for alien life, the idea is, you know, most of the instruments that NASA builds, for example, or any of the space agencies looking for life in the universe are looking for chemical correlates of life, right? right. But here we have something that is based on properties of molecules. It's not a chemical correlate. It's a agnostic. It doesn't care about the molecule. It cares about what is the history necessary to produce this molecule. Um, how complex is it in terms of how much time is needing, how much information is required to produce it? Yeah, so most, yeah, and I would say most, like most examples of biology or technology don't take the shortest path, right? But the shortest path is a bound on how hard it is for the universe to make that. Yes, because it, it doesn't, it's not contingent on looking for the chemistry of life on Earth on other planets. And it also has a deeper explanatory framework associated to it as far as the kind of theory that we're trying to develop associated to what life is. And I think this is one of the problems I have in my, my field personally in astrobiology is people observe something on Earth, say oxygen in the atmosphere or an amino acid in a cell, and then they say, let's go look for that on another planet. Uh, let's look for oxygen on exoplanets or let's look for amino acids on Mars. And then they assume that's a way of looking for life um, and it, it or even phosphine on Venus. But, you know, like there's all these examples of let's look for one molecule. A molecule is not life. Life is a, a system that patterns particular structures into matter. That's like it's that's what it is. And it doesn't care what molecules are there. It's something about the patterns and, and that structure and that history. Um, and if you're looking for a molecule, you're not testing any hypotheses about the nature of what life is. It doesn't tell me anything. If we discover oxygen on an exoplanet about what kind of life is there, just oxygen on an exoplanet. It's not, there, there's, I, I guess I think like when you think about the question, are we alone in the universe? That's a pretty freaking deep question. It should have a freaking deep answer. It shouldn't mm -hmm. just be there's a molecule on an exoplanet. Waha, we solved the problem. It should tell us something meaningful about our existence. And I feel like we've fallen short on how we're searching for life in terms of actually searching for things like us in this kind of deeper way. You, I, you know, I would have probably already solved the problem. Right. There's another Nobel Prize in there somewhere, yeah, I think, somewhere actually. Yeah, somewhere in there. Um, well, I think it's it's kind of... A, so, so there is a bias here, right? So we've evolved to recognize life on earth, right? Like I, you know, children at a very early age can tell the difference between a puppy and a plant and then the plant and a chair, for example, you know, like it just, it seems innate. Um, and so I think, and also because we're life, um, you know, I think like there's this implicit bias that we should know it when we see it and it should be completely obvious to us. Mm -hmm. Um, but there are a lot of features of our universe uh, that are not completely obvious to us, like the fact that this table is made of atoms and that I'm sitting in a gravitational potential well right now. Um, and I guess um, my point with this is I think life is much less obvious than we think it is. Um, and so it could be in many more forms than we think it is. Um, and I guess this goes back to the point about being open-minded that we may not know what alien life looks like. It might not even be possible to interact with alien life because maybe something about, you know, our our informational lineage, it makes it impossible for information from an alien to be copied to us. Therefore, there's no, you know, so to speak, communication channel. And I don't mean, you know, verbal communication, just it's not in our observational space. Like, you know, like, you know, there, there's, there's fundamental questions about why we observe the universe in position rather than momentum, but we also, you know, observe it in terms of certain informational patterns and things like that's what our brain constructs. And maybe aliens just interact with a different part of reality than we do. That's wildly speculative, but I think, I think, um, but it's possible. It's possible. And I think it's consistent yeah. with the physics. So I think the best ways we can ask questions are about, life and chemistry and asking questions about if information is a real physical thing, what would its signatures be in matter? Um, 
and and how do we recognize those? And I think the ones that are most obvious are the ones I've already articulated. You have these objects that seem completely improbable for the universe to produce because the universe doesn't have the design of that object in the laws. Mm -hmm. So therefore, an object had to evolve. We we talk we call it evolution, but it had to be produced by the universe that then had all of the possible tasks to make that object um, specified. Well, so uh, I see what you're saying. Um, so assembly theory is pretty general. Like, I mean, we've been applying it to molecules because it makes sense to apply it to molecules, but it's supposed to explain life, um, you know, like the physics of life. So it should explain, you know, the things in this room in addition to molecules. Um, so I guess... Uh, and you can apply it to images and things. So I guess the idea, you know, you could explore is just looking at everything on planet Earth in terms of its assembly structure and then looking for things that aren't part of our biological lineage. If they have high assembly, they might be aliens on Earth. I'm glad you brought up the computer vision point because for a while I had this kind of thought in my mind that we can't even see ourselves clearly. So one of the things, you know, people are worried about artificial intelligence for a lot of reasons, but I think it's really fascinating because it's like the first time in history that we're building a system that can help us understand ourselves. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, people talk about AI physics, but like, um, you know, when I, when I look at another person, I don't see them as a 4 billion year lineage, but that's what they are. And so is everything here, right? So Imagine that we built artificial systems that could actually see that feature of us. What else would they see? Um, and I think that's what you're asking. Um, and I think I think that would be so cool. <laughs> uh, uh, I want that to happen, but I think I think we're a little ways off from it. But but yeah, we're going there. I hope. Maybe not genetic, but maybe information, right? And I think part of your question is like. So, so if you just, if you think of life as like this history of events that happen in the universe, like there's this question of like how divergent are those histories, right? So when we get to the scale of technology, it's possible to imagine, imagine, although we can't even do it, like imagine all the possible technologies that could exist in the universe. But if you think about all the possible chemistries, somehow that seems like a lower dimensional space and a lower set of possibilities. Mm -hmm. So it might be that like when we interact with aliens, we do have to go back to those more basal levels to figure out sort of what the map is, mm -hmm. right? Um, like the, the sort of where we have a common history. We, all, we, we must have a common history somewhere in the universe. But in order to be able to actually interact in a meaningful way, you have to have some shared history. I mean, the reason we can exchange genetic information in each other's food or eat each other as food um, is because we have a shared history. So we have to find that shared history. The, the, we have to find the common ancestor in this causality map. The, 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 this Something, causality yes, tree. yes. And we have a last universal common ancestor for all life on Earth, which I think is sort of the nexus of that causality map for life on Earth. But the question is, where would other aliens diverge? I don't have intuition for that. Um, which I, I have always thought was deeply intriguing. So, and and part of this, uh, I mean, I say it specifically as I don't have intuition for that because it's like one of those questions that you feel around for a while and you really just, you 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 can't see it, um, even though it might be right there. And um, in that sense, it's a little like the quantum to classical transition. You're like really talking about two different kinds of physics. And I, I think that's kind of part of the problem. Once we understand the physics, that question might become more meaningful. Hmm. Um, but there's also this other issue, um, uh, and this was really instilled on me by my mentor, Paul Davies, when I was a postdoc, because he always talks about how, you know, whether aliens are common or rare is kind of just, um, you know, it's it like, you know, it follows a wave of popularity and it just depends on like the mood of, you know, what the culture is at the time. Mm -hmm. And I always thought that was kind of an intriguing observation, but, but also there's this, you know, set of points about if you go by the observational evidence, which we're supposed to do as scientists, right? Um, uh, you know, we have evidence of us, um, and one original life event from which we emerged and people want to make arguments that because that event was rapid, um, or because there's other planets that have properties similar to ours, that that event should be common, but you actually can't reason on that because our existence observing that event is contingent on that ex event happening, which means it could have been completely improbable or very common. Um, and Brandon Carter, like, clearly articulated that in terms of anthropic arguments um, 
a few decades ago. So, so there is this kind of issue that we have to contend with dealing with life that's closer to home than we have to deal with with any other problems in physics, which we're, tr- we're talking about the physics of ourselves. And when you're asking about the origin of life event, that event happening in the universe, at least is like our existence is contingent on it. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you, you can think about sort of fine tuning arguments um, that way too. So, um, but the, the, the sort of odder part of it is like when I think about uh, how likely it is, I think it's because we don't understand this mechanism yet about how information can be generated spontaneously mm-hmm. that I like, cause I can't see that physics clearly yet, even though I have a lot of, you know, like some uh, things around the space of it in my mind, I can't articulate how likely that process is. Um, so my honest answer is, I don't know. And it, it, sometimes that feels like a cop out, but I feel like that's a more honest answer and a more meaningful way of making progress than um, what a lot of people want to do, which is say, oh, well, we have a one in 10 chance of having it on an exoplanet with Earth-like properties because right. there's lots of Earth-like planets out there and life happened fast on Earth. Yes, that's, that's the problem. And yeah, and I, I think, um, I don't do that deliberately, but I do think that way. And this is sort of the inversion from the logic of physics because physics, as it's always been constructed, has treated us as external observers of the universe. And we are not part of the universe. And this is why the problem of life, I think, demands completely new thinking because we have to think about ourselves as minds that exist in the universe and are at this particular moment in history and looking out at the things around us and trying to understand what we are inside the system, not outside the system. We don't have descriptions at a fundamental level that describe us as inside the system. And this was my problem with cellular automata also. You're always an external observer (laughs) for a cellular automata. You're not in the system. What does a cellular automata look like from the inside? That would be inconsistent with the physics in my mind. But uh, so so I, I should give a caveat. I've given the, the caveat that I'm biased as a physicist, but I'm also biased as an eternal optimist. So pretty much all of my modes of operation for building theories about the world are not like an Occam's razor. What's the simplest explanation, but what's the most optimistic explanation? Um, uh, and part of the reason for that is if you really think explanations have causal power, um, in the sense that our the- like the fact that we have theories about the world has enabled technologies and physically transformed the world around us. I think I have to take seriously that as a part of the physics I want to describe and try to build theories of reality that are optimistic about what's coming next because the theories are in part the causes of what comes next. <laughs> yes. So this is dry. Like what, why the hell... Are we trying to come up with new stuff? Oh, so um, so I made this point about thinking life is the physics of existence. And it's not just the physics of existence. It's the physics of more things existing. <laughs> so I think one of these drives creativity. of like- the, Yeah, creativity, like optimism. The So, so if you like, if people like entropy. I don't, I don't like entropy as it was formulated in the 1800s. I think it's an antiquated concept. But, um, but this idea of maximizing over the possible number of states that could exist. Imagine the universe is actually trying to maximize over the number of things that could physically exist. What would be the best way to do that? The best way to do that would be evolve intelligent technological things that could explore that space. Sure. Yeah, the shadow biosphere is this idea that there might have been other original life events that happened on Earth um, that were independent from the original life event that led to us and all of the life that we know on Earth. And therefore, there could be aliens in the sense they have a a different origin event living among us. Um, uh, And it was proposed by a number of people. but one of them was uh, Paul Davies that I mentioned earlier is my mentor. And I, he has a really uh, cute way of saying that aliens could be right under our noses or even in our noses um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, with a British accent. It sounds better. But um, <laughs> but uh, but anyway, so the idea is like it could literally be anywhere around us. Um, and if you think actually about the discovery of like viruses and bacteria, you know, for a long time, we didn't they were kind of a shadow biosphere. It was life that was around us, but invisible. Um, and, but this takes it a little bit further and saying that, you know, all of those examples, viruses, bacteria, and everything that we've discovered so far has this common ancestry in the last universal common ancestor of life on earth. So maybe there was a different origin event and that life is weirder still and might be among us and we could find it.
We don't have to go out and the stars look for aliens just here on Earth. Do you think that's a serious possibility that we should explore with the tools of science? Like this I should think, be a serious effort? I think um, yes and no. Um, and I mean, yes, because I think it's a serious hypothesis um, and I think it's worth exploring. And it is certainly more economical to look for signs of alien life on Earth than it is to go and build spacecraft and send robots to other planets. And that was one of the reasons it was proposed is, well, if we do find an example of another original life on Earth, it's hugely informative because it means the original life is not a rare event. If it happened twice on the same planet, that means it's probably pretty probable given conditions are right. Um, so it has huge potential scientific impact, not to mention the fact that you might have like biochemistry and stuff that's informative for like medicine and stuff like that. But um, but I think that the thing for me that's challenging about it, and this really comes from my own work, like thinking about um, life as a planetary scale process and also trying to understand sometimes what I call like the statistical mechanics of biochemistry, but large scale statistical patterns in the chemistry that life uses on Earth. Um, there are a lot of regularities there and life does seem to have planetary scale organization mm -hmm. that's consistent even with some of the patterns that we see at the individual scale. So if you think life is a planetary scale phenomena and the chemistry of life has to be sort of um, not just, it's not, an individual is not necessarily the fundamental unit of life, right? The fundamental unit of life is these uh, informational lineages and they're mm -hmm. kind of, you know, they intersect over spatial scale. So everything on earth is kind of related by that common causal history. Yeah. So it's hard for me based on the way I think about the physics and also some of the stuff that my group has done to really think that there could be uh, evidence or, or there could be a second sample of life on earth. But I think there are ways that we need to be more concrete about that. And I have thought a little bit about like, um, you know, like you can represent the chemistry in an individual cell as a network. Um, and then those networks, something my group has shown, um, actually scale um, with the same properties. So ecosystems have the same properties as individuals as planetary scale. And then you could imagine if you had alien chemistry intermixed in there, that scaling would be broken. So if there's some robustness property or something associated to it, and you get alien chemistry in there, it just breaks everything. And you don't have a planetary ecosystem functioning um, and individuals functioning across all these scales. So I guess what I'm arguing is life is not a scale dependent phenomena. It's not just cellular life. So if you have a shadow biosphere, it has to be integrated with all of these other scales. And it and that and that would yeah. me lose the meaning of the word shadow biosphere. I, guess. I think so. Yeah. So so I, it's an open question, right? And yeah. I think it would it would tell us a lot. So there has been very minimal effort of people to look for a sh shadow biosphere. Uh <laughs> Or like if you go deep enough in the crust, maybe yeah. there's like a layer where there's no life and then there's suddenly life again. And maybe those, you know, lizard men or whatever they are that people <laughs> dream about are really down there. Um, I know that's a little flippant, but but really like there could be like chemical cycles deep in there yeah. crust that might be alive and are completely distinct in chemical or origin to surface life. Right, that they wouldn't be interacting yeah. with each other. Yeah, and that's one of the proposals for the shadow biosphere is like sometimes people talk about it as being ge geologically or geographically distinct, that it might be, you know, you have no life for this region and then a different example. And then sometimes people talk about it being chemically distinct, that right. the chemistry is sufficiently different that it's completely orthogonal or non-interacting with our chemistry. Yeah. So I've actually been more intrigued by the cultural phenomena of UFOs than the phenomena of UFOs themselves, because I think it's intriguing about how uh, we are preparing ourselves mentally for <laughs> understanding others and how we have thought about that historically and what the sort of modern incarnations of that are. Um, it, it's more like I want an explanation for us. That's my motivation. Mm -hmm. And having some, you know, streaks across the sky or something and saying that's aliens, it doesn't tell you anything. Um, so unless you have a deeper explanation and you have, you know, more lines of, uh, you know, where is this going to take us in the future? It's just not as interesting to me as the problem of understanding life itself and aliens as a more general phenomenon. <laughs> No, I think that's good. And and something I realized recently that I never thought was going to be a problem, but I think this actually helps with quite a bit, is because so many um, people nowadays believe we've already made contact, that 
as an astrobiologist, if we, you know, actually want to understand life and make contact, we kind of have to deconstruct the narratives we've already built from ourselves and kind of unteach ourselves that we've learned about aliens and then reteach ourselves. So there's this really interesting sort of dialogue there um, and making it open to the public that they actually have to think critically about it and they see the evidence for themselves, I think is really important for that process. Mm -hmm. I mean, living in a pandemic saying viruses are beautiful is probably a hard thing, but I do find them beautiful to a degree. I think even 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 in the sense of mediating a global pandemic, there's something like deeply intriguing there because, you know, these these are tiny, tiny little things. Right. Mm -hmm. And yet they can, um, uh, you know, essentially um, like cause a seizure or like, you know, handicap an entire civilization at a global scale. So just that intersection of between, you know, our perceived invincibility and our susceptibility to things and, and also the interaction across scales of those things is just a really amazing feature of our world. Maybe. I don't know. I, you know, I always get really bothered by these Darwinian narratives that are like, you know, like the fittest replicator wins and things. And I don't, I just don't feel like that's exa exactly what's going on. I think like the copying of information is sort of ancillary to this other process of creativity, right? So like so the drive is actually, the drive is creativity. But if you want right. to keep the creativity that's existed in the fa past, it has to be copied into the future. Right. So replication, like if you, so that for me is, so I had this set of arguments um, with Michael Lockman and Lee Cronin about the, like life being about persistence. They thought it was about persistence and like survival of the fittest kind of thing. And I'm like, no, it's about existence. It's like, because when you're talking about that, it's easy to say that in retrospect, you can post select on the things that survived and then say why they survived. Huh. But, um, but you can't do that going forward. I think we'll just be like the core genetic architecture or something. We'll be like the DNA for AI, right? Yeah. It's like we haven't lost the past informational architectures on this planet. They're still there. Yeah, but I don't I don't even think they necessarily need to tap in our brains. I mean, just collectively we do interesting things. What if they were just using like the patterns in our communication or something? Oh without controlling it, just ob observing? Well, I, I don't know. In what sense do you control the chemistry happening in your body? Hmm. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I, I, I obviously I don't know. I'm just, I, I just, like the way I look at, like people look at AI and then they look at this thing that's bigger than us and is coming in the future and is smarter than us. And I think though that looking at the past history of life on the planet and what information has been doing for the last four billion years is probably very informative to asking questions about what's coming next. Um, and I don't, one is planetary scale transitions are really important for new phases. So the global internet and sort of global integration of our technology, I think is an important thing. So that's again, life is a planetary scale phenomena, but we're an integrated component of that phenomenon. I don't really see that the technology is gonna replace us in that way. It's just gonna keep scaffolding and building. And, and I also don't have an idea that we're gonna build AI in a box. I think AI is gonna emerge. AGI to me is a planetary scale phenomena that's gonna emerge from our technology. whole package yep. comes as a planetary yes. scale phenomenon and that goes back to the fact that like you were you know asking questions about you as an individual like what are you as an individual you're like a packet of information that exists in the particular physical thing that is you we're all just packets of information and some of us are aggregates in certain ways but it's all just kind of exchanging and propagating right and processing <laughs> I have the natural biological urge that everyone has to fear death. Um, I think the thing that I think is interesting is if I think about it rationally, I'm not necessarily afraid of death for me because I won't be aware of being dead. Um, but I am afraid like for my kids because it matters to them if I die. Um, so, so again, like I think death becomes more significant as a collective property, not as an individual one. Doesn't it? But I don't think it disappears. It's just not me anymore. Right. So you're, but the that process of you it being not you anymore that doesn't scare you. 
Of course it does. The mystery of it. I mean, the... Yeah. But I guess I'm heartened by the fact that there will be some imprints of the fact that I existed still in the universe after I leave it. Yeah, but there'll there'll be a... Okay. And also that has to do with my perception of time, right? So, you know, I perceive time as flowing, but that might not be the case. I mean, this is, you know, standard physicist comfort is, you know, every time moment exists, you know, and is, you know, there's no, and the flow of time is just our perception of, you know, us, um, you know, us changing. Um, so you can travel back in time and that's comforting, like from a physicist's concern? No, no, no. I'm not talking about traveling back in time. I'm just saying that the moments in the past still exist. Um, now, whether the moments in the future exist or not is a different question. That's not comforting to me in terms of death. I, with the- <laughs> The flow of time is not that does not. I, I think uh, I think it's I think there's no comfort in the face of death for what we are uh, because we like existing, and I think it's especially true if you if you love life and you love what life is. No, I think so. I think things like to exist. I think they want to exist. Yeah, there's a you, yeah. Th- there's a desire whatever yeah. to exist. Yeah. And there's not- a drive to exist and there's a drive for more things to exist. I guess, um, yeah, I would like, to, I like existing. I like, I like, I like it a lot. Um, and I don't know it any other way. <laughs> but, uh, I, see, I don't even know if I like existing. I think I really don't like not existing. Yes. Yeah, that too. <laughs> I, yeah. The, yeah, maybe it's that. I, some days I, you know, I'm, I might like existing less than others, but... <laughs> Yes, but like I think those are like surface feelings. There is yeah, some, yeah. seems like there's something fundamental about wanting to exist. No, I think that's right, but I but I think to your point that 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 might go back to the more fundamental idea that you know if life is the physics of existence and maximizing existence, individual organisms of course want to maximize their existence, and everything you know like wants to exist. But I, I guess for me the small comfort is my existence matters to future existence. <laughs> about the last one (laughs) um you know a lot of people ask me this question about like like working on such hard problems like how can you make a successful career out of that but I think for me it couldn't be otherwise like I have to to be fulfilled you have to work on things you care about and that's always kind of driven me and that's been discipline department um uh and and sort of superficial level problem independent because I'm I I started at community college actually, and I was taking a physics class and I learned about, uh, you know, magnetic monopoles and they, we didn't know if they existed in the universe and, but we could predict them and we could go look for them. And I was so deeply intrigued by this idea that we had this mathematical formula to go look for things. Um, and then I wanted to become a theoretical physicist because of that, but that actually wasn't my driving question. I think I realized my driving question is the nature of the correspondence between our minds and physical reality and what we are. And, that question is very deep, so you can work across a lot of fields doing that. But I think without that driving question, I never would have been able to do all the things that I've done. It's really the passion that drives it. And I, and usually when when students ask me these kind of questions, I I tell them like, you have to find something you really care about working on because if if you don't really care about it, a you're not going to be your best at it, and b it's not going to be worth your time. Why would you spend your time working on something you're not interested in? So find um, the driving questions. Like, yeah, find the driving question. Find your your passion. I mean, I think passion makes a huge difference in terms of creativity, talent, and potential, and also being able to tolerate all the hard things that come with any career or life. Am I allowed to ask you a question? Sure. Okay. Um, on that point, because I like um, I had this colleague that suggests the idea that like consciousness might be contagious, and so interacting <laughs> with things, you know, it's That's an funny. it's no, a, yeah, yeah, it's, it's an interesting idea, it, yeah. right? So I'm I'm wondering like sort of, you know, the motivation there is it the motivation that you want more of the universe to appreciate things the way we do and appreciate those interactions, or is it really more the enjoyment of the human in those interactions? Like, is it is it I don't do you know what I'm asking? Yeah, yeah. Yes. Someone once told me as a physicist, I'm not allowed to ask why questions, but I don't believe that. So um, I think I think what we are is the creative process in the universe, I think. And I, for me, that's the meaning. Um, the ability Create. to... Yeah. 
to create more possibilities and more things to exist. I think so. So is that like, are they, is his beauty a correlate of creation? I mean, it might be. I don't know. Um, I mean, why is it, uh, you know, it, a lot of people have asked these kind of questions, but like, why is it we have such an emotional response to intellectual activity or creativity? Um, and that seems kind of a deep question to me. Like, it seems very intrinsic to what we are. So I I do have an interest in the questions I ask because I think they're beautiful and I think the universe is beautiful and um, I'm just so deeply fascinated by the fact that I exist at all. Um, and so maybe, maybe it's that, you know, that, that intrinsic feeling of beauty that's in part driving, you know, the physics of creating more things so they could be deeper related in that way. This is the Lex Free Podcast.